Thank you, everyone, for coming. Appreciate it. So as Bastian said, over the past three years, I've been working on a PhD project entitled Past and Future Hydroclimatic Variability of a Western Central Africa and their Teleconnection. An easier title would be What Can We Learn from the Past to Improve Future Projections? And this uh, project was fully funded by Coventry University, but we uh, had support from partners in France, from uh, Hydrosciences Montpellier and IRD. And we also had a partner in Benin. These partners were mainly providing stream flow data sets for the West and Central Africa. And this um, PhD project was supervised by Bastien, Diapo as my DOS, and Professor Damien, and Jonathan Eden. So, as a background, so Sub Saharan Africa is one of the poorest regions in the world. And in this region, more than 60% of the population rely heavily on rain fed agriculture. But the issue is that this region also experiences high hydroclimatic variability. So the change in precipitation is very high from a year to another. So, for example, in the 50s, this region was, most of West Africa was very wet. And then in the 70s and 80s, we had like very uh, drastic drought, which, which resulted in a lot of fatalities. And then recently, studies have showed that the trends are improving. So there is a kind of a recovery. But the main issue is that the impact of these fluctuations on the hydrological systems are not very well documented at the regional scale. So one might ask, why is the importance of working at the regional scale? The figure that you, sh you see here on the left is a field in Mali in 2012, which shows crop failure, is a millet field, I think, in 2012. And on the right, I have a map of West Africa showing in blue here, the point is not working, but showing in blue the region which were flooded on the same year. So you see that based on the spatial scale, the condition might change a lot. So this makes it very important to have a global picture at the regional scale to see how these hydroclimatic fluctuations are affecting the different uh, ecosystems. So over the region, population are highly vulnerable to climate change. So this is, uh, comes from the IPCC report. And this uh, vulnerability to climate change is also associated with very low level of adaptive capacity, meaning that population, they cannot cope with the impact of climate change because of uh, economic, demographic and national issues, political instability and so on. And recent studies on in the field of climate change show that human induced warming of the climate will reduce in, will have severe implications for natural systems. So like more floods, more droughts. And for now, the studies are showing that floods and droughts are responsible for around 80% of fatalities and around 70% of economic losses related to, nat to natural hazard. So there are urgently need for adaptation strategies. But how to build these adaptation strategies? The main approach so far is using hydrological uh, climate models, using the output of these climate models, in, uh, using this output then for, as input for the hydrological models and then have the predictions. But all this step is um, full with uncertainties. So we have, first of all, uncertainties in the warming levels. So we, uh, we don't have a clear picture of how the climate will change by 50 or 100 years. We don't know how the industrialization will work. We, are we going to have more cars, more CO2 emissions, and so on. So this is big uncertainty. Another uncertainty is uh, associated with the climate models. So the climate models are just giving a representation of the climate system, so it's just uh, solving some physical equations. But then, based on the parameterization, cloud physics, for example, and all these different equations inside, we have some uncertainty, and the results do not often match the observations, and there are some biases which need to be corrected. Another source of uncertainty is the, um, associated with hydrological models that you can see over there. And basically, for those who are not very familiar, hydrological modeling is a representation of the water cycle at a catchment scale. So basically, uh, hydrologists try to understand how much water is coming in a basin, how much is going through a runoff, how much is infiltrating. But this needs solving again some equations, some conceptualizations, which are not often straightforward. So there are a lot of uncertainties in all the modeling chain. So what we endeavored to do in this um, PhD project was just try to improve the, the predictions. So as I said, we have high internal hydroclimatic variability over the region, so it's very difficult to predict. And another issue is that we have a data scarcity due to political instabilities, equipment failure, 
and so on. So we have records of stream flow, but due to wars, people are not able to measure the actual stream flow for a day, for instance. And another issue, as I said, is the uncertainty in climate projections. So the PSG project was built around three main research objectives. So first of all, we decided to create a complete stream flow data set for the first time over the region. So we have collected stream flow data set, then reconstruct the data, and then try to understand what are the interaction between river flow, precipitation, temperatures, and all existing variables. The second objective was to take a step forward and try to understand what are the main drivers of stream flow variability in Western Central Africa, and then understand these drivers beyond the catchment scale. Of course, the catchment uh, properties such as land use and all, they affect uh, stream flow, but then what happens beyond it? Is there a relationship with sea surface temperatures or whatsoever? What can drive stream flow variability? And the third objective is we, we try to use all the knowledge based on the first uh, research objectives to improve the projection. So provide a river flow projection that we really confident are robust and so on. So now we can move to the data and methods. So this is a summary of all the um, data sets and methodology that I use during the PhD project. So in the background, you can see, I don't know if you see where, but you have the study area, uh, West and Central Africa. So for those who are not very familiar, we have up north, the, the climate is quite desertic, and then it comes to the Sahel between 12 and 16 degree north, where we have savanna, and shrubs, and then we go down to the Sudanian region and then go back in the south to the tropical humid. The main striking difference is that up north we have uh, one main rainy season, and then the south in Central Africa we have a bimodal uh, regime, so we have two rainy seasons. Um, so with the help of our partners uh, in Montpellier, we collected um, stream flow data set. All the red dots that you see are gauging points. So we collected around 800 uh, stream flow, more than 800 stream flow uh, gauging point. And then uh, data quality and cross check, we came to 152 stations because we decided to keep only stations with um, less than 50% missing data. So at least we are not reconstructing more than half of the time series. So these time series were then reconstructed using data imputation techniques. So in the thesis, for the sake of robustness, we use two different approaches. One approach which is inspired from um, artificial intelligence and another one which is more parametric. So uh, what are the different correlations between a station A and station B? And we try to use this knowledge to fill in the gaps. So if it's high in station A and station B and these kind of things. So we had the reconstructed uh, data set we had cross-validation uh, to see, uh, the, to, to test the robustness of these um, data sets. And then we also collected over the region some gridded data. So gridded data sets are product available online. So because of the scale of the study area, we cannot go to the field and measure anything. So we collected all these data sets online. So we collected precipitation temperature and all other variables related to catchment properties. And um, we collected also global sea surface temperatures. And the OLR here stands for out outgoing long wave radiation and the, the wind speed and all these things. So all these variables were used together to understand different interactions between stream flow and these variables. So we have here the objective one, understand the past uh, hydroclimatic variability. And uh, building upon these findings, we move to the third objective of the thesis here. Uh, basically provide robust hydroclimatic projections. But as I said, um, the main approach in to, to, to predict stream flow is using climate models, hydrological models, and then we have the projections. But here we, we made the assumption that using some teleconnections, meaning the relationship between stream flow and some other key variables, and reducing the step here in the modeling framework, so here we have many steps. This is a traditional one, and that's just one. So we use the climate, mod the climate models, and then we develop a regression model based on our findings of the interactions. So we assume that this, because it reduces the steps in the modeling framework, will have a potential. We were not sure about it, so we tried it. This is mostly the novelty of the, the, the PhD thesis, because most of the studies, they just focus on this approach here. So using all this approach, all together, try to find the result. 
So here I'm just sharing with you some of the, the results of the first part. So this is uh, the past hydrochromatic variability. So here on the left, I'm showing some examples of reconstructions. So the panels here on the left are the original time series. And the, um, the red rectangle uh, is, is a kind of zooming that I'm showing. So here we have some missing records. And this window is the one that I'm showing here. So in, in blue, you have the stream flow time series, the monthly time series. And then here, I'm showing in the red and black dotted line, I'm showing the, the reconstructions. So you have the two different methods. The red one, I don't know if you can see well, is the artificial intelligence based one. And the dark one is the uh, par parametric method. So the cross, uh, the cross validation that we conducted showed that both methods were quite robust with high uh, confidence in the quality of the, the reconstruction. But we found out that for some stations where land use was where we had issues with land use, land use change in all these aspects, the, the artificial intelligence based method was performing better. So we decided to use the, the reconstructions from this approach to, to continue our analysis. So with this um, reconstructed time series, what we did first was to detect the change point. So basically change points are uh, defined where there is um, as, yeah, a change between the means of different periods. In general, algorithms are used to detect only one single point, so basically detect the change between the 90s and the, and the 80s, for example. But here we performed a simulation which were able to detect two change points. Here you have the different countries, BF stands for Burkina Faso, Beijing, Benin, and so on. So you have the, and this is for all the different countries, and each line is, a kind, is the time series. The red one uh, correspond to negative shifts. So the, um, the, the stream flow is decreasing after that period, and the blue one corresponds to positive shift. So running this algorithm through the 152 stations, we, we found that at the regional scale, two main change points occurred in the 70s, one in 1970 and the other one in 1993. We also performed some trend analysis that I'm not showing here, but we, the results suggest that the, the, the change point in stream flow were induced by the changes in precipitation. So the gradual decrease in precipitation resulted in changes in stream flow. So basically that's what we, we, we found from the first time series analysis. And um, the rest of the study then was uh, focused on using these different intervals, estimating what's happening on these different intervals to find out the correlation between precipitation and stream flow. We took a step forward because we have this, um, we have the change point, but actually we don't know what happened in terms of variability. Was the variability higher from a year to year or on the multi-annual time scale? Then to detect that, we use the so-called wavelet analysis. The wavelet analysis uh, for a time series is just considered as a kind of microscope. It's just amplifying the signal. So it gives you a decomposition of the signal in both the frequency that you see here the period here is in years, so, and here is the, um, the time series, the, 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 the time frame, sorry. So when the, the red means that the, um, the variance is higher for this period, so for, is, for instance here we see that the variance is higher for a frequency between four and eight years, and down here around 16 years, and so on. So this, this was um, an approach that we used to, f to amplify and see what were the main uh, modes of variability. And um, so we found that the fluctuations are very important from interannual to multi decadal time scales. But what to do with 150 of these? You cannot show it. So we decided to go through clustering techniques. The clustering we just have is just uh, regrouping the data into homogeneous regions. So running this algorithm, we found like three main regions of stream flow variability. So the first one is most of West Africa. So most of West Africa have the same pattern in general. <coughs> and then we also found a region here, which is the lower Niger River, for those who are familiar with the region. And we, all, we have another cluster here, which is the outlet of the Congo Basin. And this station is the only one in the cluster because it has a very special uh, behavior because of different teleconnections, different interactions with precipitations and also the size of the basin. So we, here I'm showing the, 
these stations, but the, the centroids of the clusters, so the stations in a cluster which resembles, which, have, which shares the more similarity with most of the stations in the cluster. So these are the stations here. Yeah. So after that, we, we started wondering what, what, what would be the, the main drivers. Of course, we know that precipitation is the main driver, but apart from precipitation, what can drive stream flow variability? So we started investigating catchment properties. And by catchment properties, I mean, for example, the vegetation cover. So you have indices online, called the NDVI, for example, which gives a, a good understanding of the vegetation cover. We also have the, the water holding capacity, which is function of the soil, thickness of the soil layer and so on. And we also collected data about the, the depth to the ground water in general. We got it online as well. So basically the findings are uh, stations where the interannual variability is very high are often um, located in round steep catchment with shallow groundwater so that when the rainfall comes into the basin the signal is not modulated whatsoever it just goes uh, it just goes as a variability and then at the at the quasi decadal time scale so this fluctuation between 8 to 16 years quasi decadal that's what we defined in the thesis as quasi decadal we found out these fluctuations were mainly related to the vegetation cover and water holding capacity. So the higher the vegetation, the more dampened the signal will be. But then here we found at the multi-decadal time scale that it, it, is, it, it occurs in large stretch catchment, but we notice it in the soil region, which is not very well, uh, which, is, which is not known for its vegetation cover whatsoever. But then these fluctuations are mainly driven by the precipitation and studies such as the one by Diepois have found that there is high multi-decadal variability in precipitation over the soil. So this is how we explain that. So basically we found that the precipitation are driving the variabili variability, but then catchment properties are also having serve as a proxy to shape this relationship. And then the next step was to, to investigate the teleconnections. So the teleconnections are like remote controls of some different phenomena. So we try to understand what can drive high river flow in West Africa, for instance. Is it sea surface temperatures? Is it the OLR or is it wind speed and all? Here I'm showing only the examples of uh, the sea surface temperatures. So in, I mean in red is when is the sea surface temperatures are high, they are positive anomalies, and in blue are negative anomalies. So this or here are uh, for the one station in the cluster one, and this is cluster two, and so on. So basically what we see, we see that, for example, from the year-to-year -year fluctuations, river flow is primarily driven by this region here in the Pacific, where we have the so-called ENZO or en ENZO-like event. So when it's warmer in here, the cluster one, which is in Central Africa, is characterized by high river flow. So this kind of uh, interaction we're holding at the inter time timescale. But then when we go to the third cluster, for example, we see the difference is complete opposite. When, the, when we have La Nina events, for instance, then we have high um, river flow over most of West Africa. But then these relationships were not stable through the, through the, the entire timescale. When we went to the multi-decadal timescale here, for instance, we have a complete different pattern, which is mainly we have the impact of the Pacific decadal oscillation that you see here for all, but also you see the, um, the shapes here in the, at in the Atlantic. So in for, the for the third cluster, for example, we see here the, this contrast. The north is warmer and the, and the south is cooler. So this kind of, it's called the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation, which drives the stream flow variability. And uh, a very good fact is that all these teleconnections that we highlighted are the same, more or less, driving precipitation. So we were quite confident about the, the results. And then the next step was uh, try to understand the impact of climate change on the future of the climatic variability. So here by climate change, we only stopped to 2050, to the, to the mid 21st century. And one might ask why that uh, choice? It's first of all because of the, the, high, the, the, the high uncertainty in the scenarios. 
studies have shown that up to 2050, most of the scenarios are showing almost the same variations. So here, um, I've used nine different climate models, and this is the precipitation. So blue is for like more precipitation, and red is for like less. So by 2050, we see that in general, in Central Africa, the changes are very slight. It's plus minus 4% in general. So we are not to expect more much changes in Central Africa in terms of precipitation. But then, going northward over the Sahel, for example, this region over here, we see that um, the most of the model predict wetter conditions. And interestingly, these models also predict um, a zonal contrast. So we see that for most of the models, the westernmost is going to be dry, whereas the eastern and central region are going to be wetter. So this is, um, this is an agreement with most of the studies so far. And we've also investigated the, um, the future uh, temperatures. So basically we focus on minimum and maximum temperatures. And um, a good fact here is that all the models agree that it's going to be warmer. So there is no doubt about it. And in general, we see that um, the, the, the absolute changes will be higher than one degree for most of the models in general by 2050. Another interesting fact is that the, this region along the Sahel, where uh, this, which is predicted to be wetter by the models, is also predicted to be the, the warmest by most of the models. And an interesting fact that we notice here is that the minimum temperatures will be rising faster than the maximum temperatures. And it is, this is already noticeable over the area because the night temperatures are getting warmer with all the implications on population health and so on. So all these changes in precipitation and temperatures will have um, impact on river flow because of the hydrological cycle. That's what we're showing here. But as I said, we, we use two different approaches. The traditional one, which is using climate models, hydrological models, and our regression model based on the teleconnections. Here on the left, I'm showing a map of model suitability. So meaning which, models, which model performs better than the others. So red and green are for the two hydrological models that we selected. And from this map, we can see that the hydrological model structure plays a significant uh, role into this, the predictions. For example, regions over the Gulf of Guinea here, where we have high, high interaction with groundwater, in this region here, we have um, this GR2Z model is performing better because it has a groundwater component. Whereas the here crest model, which is only based on soil moisture deficit and um, linear regression function here, perform better over the, the, Niger the, the, the middle reach of the Niger River and in some part in Central um, Africa. And interestingly, we found that our approach here, our novel approach here based on the teleconnections, provide better results in Central Africa. So there is actually a potential for this regression model in data scarce region. The poor performance here uh, of the hydrological models is mainly due to data scarcity and lack of, lack of measurement on the field and very complex relationship. So using these, all these different approach, we can have be a better representation of the hydrological regime. On the right, I'm just I'm showing the, the relative change, the relative changes for each model. So the median is always around 5% in general. Some models are very are decreasing. Yes, others are wetter than, than the others. But in general, this is the, the model ensemble. Like all the, the projections, all the projections are mainly distributed around 5% uh, median. Then here's uh, the GRDSM, and this is our uh, linear regression model. An interesting fact is that the linear regression model that we develop here present higher interquartile ranges, so the fluctuations are higher. And this can be explained by mostly the impact of um, the representation of sea surface temperatures in the, the climate models in general. And of course, the predictions they have, they are, they have, they are specially distributed, and that's what I'm showing here. So on the left is the, the, the projections for the GR2M model, and on the right is the linear regression model that we've developed. So in general, we see that the, the projections over uh, Central Africa are quite uncertain, plus 
minus 5% in general. And this makes sense because this region is expected to have less rain compared to the, the Sahel. So basically the, the stream flow projections mimics the, the patterns in precipitation, which makes sense for us. But another issue was that um, this region here is going to be warmer. So there's probably be an impact of this rise in temperatures on the precipitations. But recent studies have found that the, the rise in, in precipitation, the higher precipitation, overcompensate the rise in temperatures in terms of uh, stream flow predictions. So, summary and outlook. So, uh, we found with this thesis that stream flow variability over the study area was mainly driven by precipitation. We also found that catchment properties play an important role in shaping stream flow rainfall variability. And then we detected three main regions which are uh, coherent and make sense with, the, with the, the, the patterns of precipitation over Western Central Africa because many studies have shown a contrasting pattern between Central Africa and West Africa in general. So the three regions that we, we, de we detected here make kind of sense. We detected also different scales of variability. So there is like a high year to year variability and then also a multi-year variability depending on the region we are located. So stream flow variability over the study region was um, driven also by different factors which uh, drive precipitation over the study area, meaning sea surface temperatures and all these different patterns. So at the interannual time scale, we highlighted the, the importance of ENSO, for instance. And then at the multi-decadal time scale, we highlighted the importance of the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation. Regarding the, the future, so we've shown that in Central Africa, changes are quite uncertain and not really significant, plus minus 5%. But as far going northward, it becomes wetter, but then we have a zonal contrast in this region as well, where the westernmost is drier, up to 20% drier, and the eastern and the central and eastern part is wetter around higher than 15%. So we've detected significant changes in temperatures and all these changes in precipitation temperature will have uh, an impact on the hydrological regime through a change by plus 5% in general over the study area in terms of stream flow. So what we, can, what we learn mainly from this project is that using an eclectic approach like the traditional one, hydrological models, climate models, is not often it does not provide better results in data scarce environment. So it's worth examining other methods such as based on the teleconnections and linear re regression models. So what to do next? Further analysis with more climate models, more ideological models to be able to capture the whole spectrum. And then also an important uh, aspect would be to share the result with the uh, policymakers over the region and also be able to optimize existing networks because without no data we can run all the models we want but I'm not sure we can have any significant results. And then extend probably the research to the water energy food nexus if it's possible, see the interactions and engage with stakeholders and try to develop climate adaptation strategies, early warning systems and so on. And I'll also be very happy to discuss with you to see what can be done at core level because we have the projections already. So if you think about something that can be done in terms of water quality, sediment transport, so on, that would be really interesting. Thank you for your attention and for more. Have <laughs> Thank you.